Good morning, FBC, uh, Hesperia, for joining us online. Um, please join us in worship as we praise our wonderful King this morning, okay? Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And I am not a captain to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. No, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. The power in your name. The power in your name. My fear doesn't. Chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, I'm standing in. Father, 
I fall into grace. There's no need to hide it, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Hello everyone, here are the three giving options for the First Baptist Church of Hesperia. You can go to our website at fbch.org and choose Give at the right side of the menu. On the Give page, enter the amount you wish to give and choose if it is a one-time or a recurring give and press Next. You will then be asked to enter and confirm a phone number to continue to the payment page. Another option is by cash or check. Please mail checks to 9280 Maple Avenue, Hesperia, California, 92345. Thank you for your giving faithfulness. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call the church. Good morning. My name is Ted, and I'm a happy member of First Baptist Church here in Hesperia. The Women's Fall Bible Study starts Wednesday, August 31st at 6.30 p.m. It's not too late to join. 
order your copy by scanning the QR code on your bulletin or by signing up at the Welcome Center. Clay is hosting a women's bonfire worship night. Join us on September 10th at 6 p.m. here at First Baptist Church Asperia. On Sunday, September 11th at 9 a.m., join us for the 101 Pastor's Welcome Class. This class is to meet with Pastor and to get to know him and our church beliefs and values, learn about baptism, and more. This class also gives you an opportunity to officially become a church member. Sign up by visiting the Welcome Center or by scanning the QR code on the back of your chairs. Hesperia Days is coming up and we need your help. On September 17th, sign up to be a part of the booth. Hand out flyers, help kids with games and join us as we participate in the 5K walk. More information and signups available at the Welcome Center. Special guest, Dr. Jonathan Jarbeau will be coming to First Baptist Church on September the 18th to hold a seminar after the eight o'clock and 1015 services. The seminar will relate to estate planning and is completely free to all who attend. Be sure to join us. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you're a guest with us this morning, we invite you to fill out our welcome card, scan the QR code in front of you, or fill one out at the Welcome Center. Turn it in at the Welcome Center. We, will, we can meet with you and send you home with more information. There's also a gift waiting for you. If you've been with us for some time now and feel ready to take the next step, fill out the serving card. You'll get connected with ministry leaders and learn about serving ministries you can request information for. No experience necessary, we'll train you. Thank you for joining us today and being a part of all that we're doing here at First Baptist Church, Hesperia. If you have a Bible, open to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We are going to finish up our series. And we've been looking at love from 1 Corinthians 13. Trying to figure out, I want to know what love is. And so we're going to focus on the last verse. But as we've been doing through the whole time together, I would like to read the whole passage. And so I'm going to start in verse 1. Paul says, if I speak human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions, and if I give over my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. But then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. As we pray every week, I pray I would decrease and you increase. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, not just for information, but for transformation. Teach us to love, empower us to love the way Jesus loved, and to be more like him in everything that we do. For your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
So as we're wrapping up our time together in 1 Corinthians 13, we're just going to look at the last verse here. Now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You know, at the end of the day, we always ask ourselves the question, what really matters when all is said and done? We can all look back at our lives and look and analyze our lives, even right now. And we say, you know, we have all these things, all these blessings, all these issues in life, but all these good things that we look at. And we look at these things and we say, well, what, what really matters? Often when people go through tragedy, they, they see the, the ashes of the remains of the things that they had. Perhaps somebody who, who had just gone through a fire and their house entirely burned down. And they look out at the, the all the thing left is the foundation and they always end up saying, you know, we, we have what matters. We have each other. We have our family. And it's always amazing how we seem to be able to, when we sit down and pause and think about it, ask ourselves and answer most of the times correctly, what really matters when all is said and done? If we go back to the start of this whole, whole series, Faith, Hope, and Love, that we've been doing now for, for several, several weeks, and then back to this chapter, remember Paul's been talking to the Corinthian church, and he's been talking about uh, the fact that they've been dealing with some issues in their church that were big problems, and the biggest problem that they were probably dealing with was love. They didn't have any. They were gifted, they had wealth, they had these things, but they didn't really demonstrate love. And it was causing disruptions in their worship services. It was causing all kinds of things within the life of their church. And that was all a witness to the community of Corinth around them. And this greatly concerned Paul. And so he wrote this letter to, to give them some correction about this. And then he takes this chapter in chapter 13. And, and between these sandwiching, between talking about spiritual gifts, and it says love is the superior way. You can actually go back as we started this whole series a few weeks ago and go back to verse 12, or chapter 12 of verse, verse 31, where it says, But desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. Well, that better way is love. And that's what he's been talking about all through 1 Corinthians 13. That's what we've been looking at for the level, last several weeks. I'll get it out. Paul, in his conclusion of his discussion about the superior way, the way of love, brings in the two other virtues that we have been looking at over these last, quite frankly, several months. We've been talking about faith, and we talked about hope, and faith and hope are wonderful, and Paul spoke of them often in his letters. Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I just picked one. I could have picked a, another one. He says we walk by faith and not by sight. In Philippians 3, 8 and 9, he says, More than that, I consider everything to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. Paul's hope wasn't in the things of this world. He lived this out. He demonstrated this in his entire life journey. He talks about it in, in all through his letters. He walked by faith. He lived by faith in Jesus. He trusted in the promises and the hopes of Jesus that Jesus had promised to him, the promises of Scripture. And as he looked and focused in on those things, he could deal with all the other things of life, and he could come to the conclusion that he did say in Philippians 3, where he says, I can all these things in this world to be but dung compared to knowing Christ and gaining Christ and be found in him. And we're found in him as we come to faith, and we're found in him, and we have our ultimate goal as we hope 
and live for heaven. So as wonderful as faith and hope are, and he talked about this, he comes to this last sentence in verse 13, and he says the greatest of these virtues, faith is great, hope is great, but love is the greatest. So we can kind of just go back and and review what we've been talking about for these last several months as we come together, because we need to do that in order to work through the verse, and we can honestly say that faith is great. Hopefully none of us will have an argument with that. Faith is great. We went back and looked at Hebrews 11. And we walked through Hebrews 11. And I remind you of Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by this our ancestors were approved. Faith is how we receive the blessings of the gospel. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. Romans 5, 1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I come back and remind you very quickly of what faith is and why faith is great. And faith is the absolute conviction based on the promises of God that makes the future present and the unseen seen. So we as followers of Jesus, we live our lives as if that which we hope for is real now because we believe it is real now. We look forward to that time. We live our lives justified before God. We live our lives by faith, believing in the promises that He's given us, that He has saved us and empowered us by His Holy Spirit. And at the end of the day, when all is said and done, that which He promised to us will be ultimately fulfilled. And we have absolute conviction about that. Some people have a problem with that, but that's how we're to live our lives. We're to live our, we live our lives because Jesus is real. We have faith that He is real, even though we've never seen Him. We know He's real. We know where He's at. We know what He's promised to us. And we live our lives with that conviction based off of what he said and what he's done for us. Faith is great. It means we don't have to work for it. That's why it says we are justified by faith. We are saved by God's unmerited favor, by grace, through faith. It's not from me. It's not from the works that I do. It's a gift. It's a gift. God gives it to us. And there's no reason for me to boast in that because God's the one who gave it to me. If I say I take credit for my stuff, it gives me something to boast about. But we can't do that because it's a gift from God. If God gave it to us, what do you have to boast in? Because it didn't come from you. Faith demonstrates that and lives that out. And I just remind you of the simple illustration that we use all the time. Wherever you may watch me, wherever you may be sitting, you sat down in that chair, and you just sat down in that chair. You've sat in that chair a zillion times, and you just sat down in that chair with the complete trust and assumption that that chair was going to hold you one more time. That's faith. It's an example of it. That's how we live life. We just do it. That's walking by faith. Faith is great, and it makes hope great. Faith and hope go hand in hand. You have, we believe in the promises of God. It empowers us, and hope gives us something to look forward to. 
Faith makes what we hope for in the future now. And what do we hope for? What do we hope for as followers of Jesus? We looked at this as we looked through the Psalms to look at hope in the Psalms. We, we hope in the return of Jesus and we look forward to that day. We hope in our own resurrection as Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 15. We hope in our own glorification, meaning that we'll be glorified and be, and be in heaven with Jesus. That's what he promised to us, our reign with him. He says that we are co-heirs with him. We receive an inheritance just like he does. We hope for these things. We have faith and live at these things. are there waiting for us. We say we're going to heaven. We believe we're going to heaven. We have a conviction that we're going to heaven, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. And we hope for that heaven and not for these things of this world. At least we shouldn't. It's a hope for things in this world that are temporary and flawed and rust and decay. Jesus tells us that's not where hope is is found. Hope is found in Jesus Christ. We hope for heaven, and it only comes through him. Our hope is in the reality of the fulfillment of the promises that God has given us. We hope for these things, and we wait for those things, and and we live out those things. And those who have genuine faith and followers of Jesus are to be people of hope. We as followers of Jesus, because of what we hope for that is to come, and we live as if it's real now because it is real now, We should be the most hopeful people on the planet. We talked about that several times through the series. We, of all the people walking the planet, we who are followers of Jesus are to be people of hope. The theme in our church for this kind of of an unwritten theme in in a lot of what we're doing is, is hope. And we're now moving into a season of life where People start hoping in a lot of things that are very temporary, very flawed, and don't last. That's not where our hope should lie as followers of Jesus. We have faith in Jesus. Our hope is for the things that he promises us. We know they're there. They're waiting for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That's where our hope resides. That's what we hope for. We rejoice, or you rejoice, in this. Even though now, for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that, you, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving The goal of your faith, the salvation of our souls. That is where our living hope resides. Faith is great. Hope is great. But then Paul comes back and said, the greatest of these is love. It begs the question, doesn't it? I mean, we all want these other things. I mean, faith is big. We talk about faith all the time. That's a big theological thing. And hope is what we, 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 we look forward to these things. That's what gives us excitement and gives us joy. And I understand that. And that's great. But love is the greatest. Because love is what we talked about last week. Love is eternal. Faith and hope exist now. 
Faith and hope remain now, but they will not always exist. You see, our faith is in someone. Our faith is in Jesus. John 3.16, For God so loved the world in this way, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Our faith is in Jesus. Our hope is in someone. Our hope is in Jesus. Our faith is in Jesus. Our hope is in Jesus. 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and we will be, and we will be as has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, what hope? That hope of seeing Jesus just as he is, of seeing ourselves as we truly are, God's children, as we hope for that day, as we long for that day. All who have this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Our faith is in Jesus and what he's done for us. We believe in him. Our faith in him saves us. It's by his grace for his glory, not of works so that none of us can boast or put our trust and faith with him. We confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. We will be saved from what? Saved from an eternity separated from Jesus and into a place that is eternally separated from him, a place that Jesus calls where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's hell. No, we don't like to talk about that, but our hope is not in hell. Our hope is in not going there. We know we're not going there. Why? Because we have faith. Why do we hope that? Because we have faith. Why do we hope that? Because our hope is in that. Our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in Jesus. So while our faith is in Jesus and while our hope is in Jesus, so we can say faith is in someone, our hope is in someone, but love is someone. 1 John 4, 8 and 9. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. Love is greatest because love is eternal, and love is eternal because that is who God is. It is what God is. It is the essence of his being. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Faith and hope do not need to continue to be the objects of what we look for because faith and hope become fully realized. Romans 8, 24 says, Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope because who hopes for what he sees? See, in heaven we don't have to hope to see Jesus. We will see Jesus. We don't have to have faith in somebody we have not seen, as Peter talked about, because we will see him as he actually is, as, as what Paul talked earlier. We won't just see him partially as in a mirror, but we will see him fully. He will, we will know him fully as he fully knows us now. Love encompasses faith and hope. That's why we saw earlier on in 1 Corinthians in 13 and verse 7. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 6, it bears all things, believes all things, that's faith, and hopes all things. 
Love encapsulates, it encompasses faith and hope. God gives us his love, and that is our eternal link to him now in this life as we trudge along in the ways of the world, as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to live along and do the things that we are called to do in this planet, God does not have or does not need faith or hope. doesn't need them. We won't need them in heaven. God doesn't need to have faith. God doesn't need to have hope. Why? What's he, what is God going to have faith in? What does God need to hope in? He's God. We need those things. But when the time comes, we won't need those things anymore. But what we will need is what God desired from us all the way back to the book of Genesis when he created the universe and he created earth and he created the Garden of Eden. He created Adam and Eve to have a relationship with him, for them to love him, and for him to love them. And that love is what we're supposed to live out. And for lack of a better word of saying, sense and experience. Love is the most godlike we can ever be to anybody. We can offer love. We can live out love. We are told to live out love. So if you want to be like God, if I want to be like God, the most precious thing, the most important thing, the greatest thing that I can do is love him. That, that's hard for a lot of us. It's been amazing to me through this whole series. I've said it a couple times uh, as, as we've gathered together through this time of going through 1 Corinthians 13, how many comments I've gotten about this this whole series, because this, this idea of love and how we're supposed to love and what that looks like, it really hits us right between the eyes of, of how we're supposed to live. Faith is this kind of obscure thing that we kind of get, but we kind of don't get, but we know we're supposed to believe in Jesus, so we go with that. Hope, we know we're supposed to have hope and, and supposed to live out hope and, and to do that, and we can hope for heaven and hoping for something that's outside there, and it takes it long past our, our level of hope that most of us live in, but we know we're supposed to hope for something like heaven. That, that gives us hope. We get that. But it's still kind of obscure. But then it talks about love. And Paul comes down and he breaks this stuff down into intensely practical things that makes us look at our lives every single day and ask ourselves the question, am I loving the way God calls me to love? And if we are not doing that in any of these ways that he describes here in 1 Corinthians 13, then we need to stop, get on our knees, confess, repent, and move forward. If we like to bloviate and run our mouths and shoot our mouths with all kinds of things about how we feel we know about God and, and what he's shown us, but we don't love the people we're, t- we're talking to or addressing, it's wasteful. That's why he calls them loud gongs and cymbals. If I give away all I have to show everybody that I'm somehow godly, more godly than anybody else on the planet, but don't love them, I don't gain anything. And I fa- if I say I have faith, and I believe, and I believe in the biggest, most wonderful things that, that are beyond my ability, and they're completely there, but I don't love the people that I interact with, then Paul's phrase, I am nothing, comes to light. How does this, what does this look like? And that's the thing about this. He gets really practical. What does this look like? Well, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, love is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable. And and all of us are sitting here, we look at this and we just say, wow, 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 blew it, blew it, blew it. Struggle with this. I got the most comments about it does not keep a record of wrongs. It's amazing. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures never all things. But we really do want love to never end, and it doesn't. It's the greatest. It's the way we are to live. It is the superior way 
to live. It is the superior way that we are to function and to go out into our world. You see, the Corinthian church is being asked by Paul a very important question. That's a very important question for all of us to answer ourselves, not only in our own personal lives and our own faith walk, but also in the lives of the communities of faith that we may be a part of, whether it's here at First Baptist Church of Spare, whatever church you may be a part of. You have to ask yourself this very, very important question. Is love the highest priority in our pursuit to be all that God desires for us to be? And all that God desires for our church or your church to be. That's really an important question. It stems back to everything that we've talked about for the last several weeks that we've talked about love. Back in John 13, verse 1, and before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come. He knows it's about time. It's, it's, good. it's about to go down. His time to depart from this world to the Father. And it says this. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's a profound, profound statement. This agape love, this sacrificial love, this God kind of love. It's the only way I know to describe it. It's a completely sacrificial and selfless love. God himself demonstrated this in Jesus. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The end of that life that he lived on this planet We know the rest of the story, that he rose three days later and is seated at the right hand of his father. Now, how do I know that? By faith. It's where my hope resides. He loved us to the end. He's loving us now. And we are to love others because we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out and to love. The first fruit of the Spirit, it's... Well, we have all the fruits, but just when we get there, we're about to start Galatians here uh, in, in, our, in our church next week. And love is the first thing. Love is the most godlike thing we can do. He loved them to the end. Which means what for us, for you and me? It kind of means we're to love to the end. It goes back to the the end of chapter 13 in John 13, verses 34 and 35, when he he told him this to wrap that up. He says, I give you a new command. Love one another. We've talked before. We've talked many times through this whole series. That is not the new command. It's just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. What does that look like? He loved them who were in the world. He loved them to the end. That love that we are to demonstrate, that love that we are to live out every single day within our communities of faith is the the essence of who we are to be as a church. It's the essence of who we are to be as Christians because we make up the church. What's he say? Verse 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples. If. You love one another. If you love one another. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I am uh, going to wrap up our time here. And for the many of you know, and many people know, uh, Rick Warren, he, he has uh, been pastor of the Saddleback Church in Orange County for 43 years. He gave his next to last message, him and his wife Kay shared last week at their church. And 
they were been talking about these things, and, and Rick kind of summed up his time there. And I'm not really here to get into a whole lot about how you feel about Rick Warren or any of this stuff, but what he says here, you need to listen to. He says, it's been our privilege to love you and to pray for you and to serve you all these years. They got ready for this message and they look at these things together and they put together life lessons and they were looking through all of these things and Rick got down to his, Kay said her part about what she shared with their church and Rick got up and said if I could only say the last thing to you as your pastor I want to say this live a life of love Inject love into everything you do and express love to everyone you meet. Rick encouraged. I'm not talking about loving your family and loving your friends. That's easy to do. Anybody, even an atheist, can do that. Loving those who are lovable doesn't require God's spirit in your life. Living a life of love means you make a conscious effort to show love to anybody and everybody and all people with no exceptions. Regardless of how they look, what they believe, how they vote, and every other difference that we see in our society. He explained that living a life of love sounds simple, but has deep implications. God's model for learning to love everybody is Jesus. Christ-like love is sacrificial and never waits for someone to ask for it. He points to Jesus' death on the cross as the example. Everything you do must be done with love. Everything, even little things. Yeah, you can think of a thousand ways to show love in everything you do. You can give somebody your parking spot out of love. You could say a kind word to everybody you meet out of love. You can refuse to be snarky on social media out of love. Love is more important than anything else. The Bible tells us to seek a life of love as if your life depended on it. Because it does. Love is is the thing God wants more than anything else from you. Those are good words. They're important words. That's the character. That's the way. That's the superior way. That's how we're supposed to live. It's how we're supposed to live as a community. That's what's going to change the world. Now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. I pray your blessings on all who receive it. May your spirit speak to their spirit. Remind them how much you love them. How much Jesus loves them. How much you love them, Father. How much you desire for us to love one another and to love each other as a community of faith and to love the people in the world because that's what they need to see from us. So that we, they know that we are your followers. Jesus came into this world as an act of love. He sacrificed himself because he loved us. And it's because we love that we share this message to the world. And say that if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we invite you to do it now because God loves you. Say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead, and today I make him Lord and Savior of my life. 
I want to know what love is, and I want to learn it from Jesus. Father, for us who are already followers of Christ, we can say, I want to know what love is. We know. Now we want to live it. May we do that for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this week. I pray you have a blessed week, and we'll see you next time here at First Baptist Church, Hesperia. Have a great week, everyone.